Hello and welcome to our session on choosing images for sharing evidence. I'm Sarah Chapman. I'm here with my colleagues Selina Ryan Vig, and we're both knowledge brokers at Cochrane UK. Before we start, uh, a bit of housekeeping. This interactive session will give you an overview of our new Cochrane guidance for choosing images. It's going to give you some opportunity to reflect on the challenges of image selection and to give some practical advice to help you improve your dissemination products. The sessions for anyone interested, but will be of particular interest to people involved in choosing images to share alongside health evidence or choosing images for other products like news items. Throughout this presentation, we'd like to get your views by asking questions via the poll function on the right hand side of your screen. You'll need to click on poll to submit your responses. Additionally, if you have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A function available on the right hand side of the screen. You can do that as we go along and we'll answer them at the end. We'll also stop halfway to give you a chance to submit any questions you've thought of so far. If you find a particular question or comment relevant, you can vote on it by clicking on the thumbs up. Also, a reminder that if you're on Twitter, you're welcome to tweet about the session and connect with us using the hashtag virtually Cochrane. So let's make a start. We've developed this resource for anyone who needs to choose images for a dissemination product based on a Cochrane review or other products such as news items for websites or images for tweets. We've developed it with the help of a global advisory group and additional colleagues with the support of Cochrane's central knowledge translation team and the guides based on and consistent with Cochrane's dissemination checklist. Here are some images used alongside a recent news story which ran in the British media. It was about how over 50s are rushing to book holidays after having their COVID vaccination. These examples bring to the fore lots of the challenges that we're presented with when we're choosing images for Cochrane products, but they also signpost to some of the solutions. We'll have a poll now and we'd like you to vote for the image that you think is the best one to accompany this story. Cast your vote via the poll function on the right hand side of your screen. You'll need to click on poll to submit your responses. So which image is the best? The street cafes, the coach passengers, the couple arriving at the airport, the lady being vaccinated or the couple on the beach? Just allowing a little bit more time for the vote to come through. That's great. So what's really interesting to see is that there's been a total split across the different options and the favorite being the picture of the couple arriving at the airport, which is very positive to see because as we'll go into a moment, that's probably also one of our preferences here. But before we talk a little bit more about these images in detail, we're going to go on to a second poll. And this time we're going to be asking you what you think is the poorest image to accompany this news story. So again, the street cafe, the coach passengers, the couple arriving at the airport, the lady being vaccinated, or the couple on the beach. It looks like we've got a little bit of a head with the polls then. We've skipped forward to a, to a future poll, but we'll, we'll talk through some of the issues with these images anyway. So one of the things that we need to think about with an image is the appropriateness of that image in a given context, and we need to show best practice. So in this example, given the current context of the pandemic, there's a problem with showing people who aren't socially distancing. 
for example, the people on the coach, but also within the detail of the image of the street cafes. On close inspection, people aren't distancing in the background. Images like these risk us looking out of touch and also out of step with public health messaging. A couple of the images, the couple on the beach and that of people arriving at the airport do this quite nicely. They show people wearing masks, for example. A couple of other issues, we need to use images that are realistic and relatable, and also that demonstrate diversity. In the coach image, for example, the people are too old for the demographic that we're talking about. They're clearly well over their 50s, and they're all white. Similar criticism could be made of the image of the lady being vaccinated. On the other hand, some images, such as that with the couple on the beach, do better at representing diversity. The coach image is also problematic because it has an exaggerated and inappropriate emotional tone. Others have much more neutral, realistic expressions and tones, so do better in this sense. Finally, showing somebody being vaccinated might seem like a safe choice. However, this specific example we've shown you would be best avoided because it includes a brand name, in this case, Boots. Image choice really matters images have impact. The example here is an image used to accompany a BBC news item about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and it was met with derision on social media, notably by health professionals. The image shows someone clearly taking blood, not giving a vaccination. Well chosen images can help people understand and engage with your text or, put, or bad images can put them off. If you get image choice wrong, it can undermine confidence and trust not just in the information you're sharing, but in the organisation itself. And as a health organisation, it's especially important that we represent health and healthcare topics accurately. Here's an overview of what's included in the guide itself. We're going to talk through some of the items in the guide and we've selected a couple of examples to illustrate some of those items but this presentation isn't intending to be a comprehensive overview. Many items have multiple aspects to them, so we do encourage you that if you're interested, please do take a look at the full guide. The checklist included in the guide has separate items, but there's lots of overlap, and that's because when choosing images, you often have to be thinking about a lot of things at once. We'd also like to flag that the guidance includes advice on technical aspects of using images, Again, we're not going to go through these in this talk, but we'd just like to really highlight that they're there. So this includes advice on ensuring that you have the correct permissions to use an image, that it's of sufficient resolution and not fuzzy or distorted, that you add an appropriate text description of images for visually impaired people, and that you credit the image where that's appropriate or necessary. Appendix one also has lots of good examples of sources of images many of which are free and some of which are healthcare specific. For example, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a really good library of realistic vaccination photos. So we're going to move on to some of the items in the checklist now. This one is about involving your target audience and seeking their feedback. This might be as simple as just checking with one person with relevant expertise. When we were preparing a, a blog about treatment for neonatal jaundice, we initially picked the image on the left. We thought this might be suitable, but we knew we should check with Katie, who was the paediatrician who'd written the blog. She told us, mm, the picture's nice, but that's quite an old fashioned phototherapy lamp. We asked her to look for something more suitable in a stock library. She found lots of images showing phototherapy being used incorrectly. One even showed a baby fully dressed under the lamp. She was very keen to show best practice, as were we. Uh, and that was a problem because there were some otherwise quite nice images of babies who were lying on their fronts, but they weren't obviously being monitored and that posed a safety concern. She recommended the image on the right. She felt that accurately and safely represents phototherapy. So that was the one we used. And it's worth noting that in the stock library, the image was incorrectly labeled. We're now more conscious that we may not realize what we don't know. Small details really matter and people with the knowledge of those subjects will pick up errors very quickly. You might also consider using an image selected or created by a target audience member. 
the one on the left is one of the images from art that were chosen by people who blogged for us about their experiences of cancer. Art can provide a really powerful alternative to stock images. The bloggers for this series were actually really pleased about being consulted over image choice, which felt to us particularly important as they were sharing their own very personal experience of illness. Images were part of representing their uh, illness experiences in a way that felt right for them, but we gathered it was quite unusual for them to be consulted. This image on the left was also made by someone with cancer as part of an initiative known as the Breast Cancer Art Project. The image in the centre was drawn by a Cochrane consumer to illustrate her experience as a carer and that accompanied her blog on the topic. The image on the right comes from a collection called the Migraine Art Collection, which were images created by people to represent their experience of migraine. However, one lesson we've learned here is that even when you're choosing an image created by a person with lived experience, it's still important to really think about other considerations. So when we were developing the guide, we initially picked a different piece from this art collection, which showed hands with exaggerated long fingernails to depict the pain experience. We didn't think there was any problem with that, but a member of the advisory group told us that in her location, Cameroon, the image would have connotations of witchcraft and so could be off-putting. So we changed it for a different one. This next item is about depicting a diverse range of people, both across your products and within products, to ensure a wide range of representation and inclusivity. If you're using more than one image in a dissemination product or an image with more than one person, consider showing variation within the relevant population. That might include people of different ages, genders, ethnicities and body types, or perhaps not always showing family as a man, a woman and children. Consider also using images of people with visible disabilities when illustrating topics that aren't about disability. For example, the image on the right, which includes a girl with one hand, this could be used to illustrate a review about exercise interventions for young people. This next item is about depicting the evidence accurately, whether that's the population, the intervention and or the setting. It's about showing the right thing being used in the right way in the right place. And if in doubt, it's a really good idea to check with somebody, whether a healthcare professional, a person with lived experience, or a review author or editor. The key thing here is that the image should reflect the evidence the review authors actually found rather than what they searched for. For example, if the authors searched for studies in children and adults, but only found studies in adults, they'd want to choose adults uh, only. Be aware that stock images which show healthcare equipment, health conditions and interventions may be inaccurate and or inappropriately labelled, just as we saw with the earlier example of the baby having phototherapy. The example shown on the screen is from colleagues in Cochrane, Norway, when illustrating a review on infection prevention and control measures among healthcare workers. The image on the left was chosen initially to illustrate this review. However, healthcare professionals who were asked for feedback pointed out that it didn't show good practice because people are shown touching their masks and goggles with gloved hands and wearing watches and jewellery. They also noted that the equipment shown is lighter than the equipment that would be commonly used. The picture on the right was approved to replace it. Another consideration here was not to show overly expensive looking equipment, which would be unavailable in some settings. The next item is about avoiding images with misleading presentations of intervention effects or images that could appear to recommend a treatment. Images showing treatment effects could exaggerate benefits or harms or the certainty of the evidence. I'm going to think about this now in relation to the topic of treatments for subfertility and assisted reproduction. Uh, so we're going to have a poll now. Uh, please take a moment to look at the images here really carefully. Um, so we're going to ask you uh, via the poll function on the right of your screen, would you choose to illustrate a review on treatments for subfertility or assisted reproduction? Would you choose the mum and the baby, the woman looking at the pregnancy test, the man comforting the sad woman, the couple with a baby scan picture or the pregnancy test kit? <laughs>
Okay, so there's a, a strong favour on the pregnancy test kit choice there. So we think the images of looking at, of a woman looking at the pregnancy test and also the man comforting the sad woman are both perfectly reasonable choices. Um, so the woman looking at the pregnancy test has a neutral expression, which doesn't suggest what the result might be. So this could be a good choice. The sad couple might also be suitable. It doesn't particularly apply and imply an effect of the intervention either way. It could just be seen as showing their experience of the health condition and the stress of undergoing treatment. Other suitable alternatives not shown here could include an image of a consultation with a health professional or images showing other aspects of a person's experience of the health condition and of treatment. The images of mum and baby and the couple with a baby scan could imply that treatment will result in a pregnancy or a live birth. And these are risky choices to illustrate a review on fertility treatments. Even if the treatment was shown to have a beneficial effect, such as increasing the number of live births, this effect wouldn't be experienced by all women having this treatment. As for the image with just the pregnancy test kit, often showing equipment or a medical device relevant to a particular topic might be a safe way of employing of avoiding implying anything about the effects of the treatment. But in this case, the image is best avoided because it shows a brand name. And that leads us on to the next item in the checklist. So this is about avoiding depicting a, a particular brand or trade name of medications and also bear in mind equipment, as this could appear to endorse it or suggest vested interests. It's really important to ensure that the images you choose of alternatives are accurate, though, because that's important for credibility. So in the example here, the medication comes as a white tablet. So the image on the top right wouldn't be an appropriate alternative to the image showing the brand name Ritalin. But we could use the bottom image. We're going to pause now just to allow you a couple of moments to type in questions that you might have thought of so far during the first half of this presentation. Uh, you're welcome to submit them using the Q&A function on the right hand side of the screen. Um, we'll be answering these and any other questions that you might have from this point onwards at the end. <laughs> Okay, so the next item is about making sure that the people, activities and settings you show are realistic and relatable. And the example we have here is choosing an image to illustrate a review on yoga for rehabilitation after stroke. Although in both the images, the people shown are the right demographic, that's people in their 60s, and carrying out the right intervention, yoga, for the review, the image on the left shows an unrealistic level of physical functioning. The image on the right may be more realistic and relatable for people rehabilitating after stroke. In choosing images that are realistic and relatable, it's important to consider showing natural and often neutral facial expressions, which are quite rare in stock libraries, uh, which are appropriate for many um, healthcare situations. Stock images can so often feel posed and unrealistic with nothing between delight and complete distress. It's important to consider showing a realistic variety of experience and activity for people living with a health condition, and that includes positive, neutral and negative aspects, and also just doing everyday things. The examples here are possible images used to illustrate Cochrane reviews on common mental health problems, such as depression and anxiety. There are lots of considerations when selecting images to share with evidence on mental health problems. One of them is triggers, and we'll be coming back to that because that was so important that it's got an item in its own right. It's important to use images that represent the variety of people's experience of mental health problems, not a, just a cliched version of it, and to avoid contributing to mental health stigma. The image on the top left is an example of what's sometimes called a head clutcher image, commonly used to illustrate mental health problems by depicting someone holding their head in their hands. Now, some people find these relatable, but this type of image has been criticised as perpetuating a stereotype of what mental distress looks like. The other images may be preferable. On the top right, that shows two people engaged in an everyday activity a contrast to the more commonly used images of a person isolated. It could suggest comfort and support. It's a positive image. 
On the bottom left, that shows someone in a natural, subdued pose. And this challenges the stereotype of mental distress being clearly visible. Images of art, including those created by people with lived experience of health condition, as we've already said, can be highly impactful and relatable choices. That one in the bottom row in the middle is an illustration done by someone in the UK about their own experience of living with obsessive compulsive disorder and the quest for information about it. And on the right, we have the sculpture Melancholy, which is a powerful example. This next item is about thinking about the appropriateness and acceptability of an image in a, a given setting and culture. It's about considering whether an image is going to be appropriate in the settings for which your dissemination product is intended. The example shown here, an image showing people touching on the top row might be an unacceptable in some cultures. So consider instead using images on the bottom row, for example, that avoid showing physical touch, except of, of, of course, where touch is a necessary part of that intervention, for example, inserting a cannula. If you're trying to illustrate something from a culture that's not your own or with which you're not familiar, then you should consult someone with suitable knowledge or even use an alternative. Be aware also of current context. Major external events could make an image inappropriate. For example, images that would normally be fine might be inappropriate during the pandemic. For example, showing someone in a gym for a view on exercise would be inappropriate if gyms were shut. Where a topic or findings may be upsetting, controversial or disappointing, we need to think critically about the images we use and make sure we're sensitive to these issues. And again, it's really good to check your choice with at least one other person. While in Cochrane we do use images of children, there are ethical considerations, including whether they've given informed consent and would be happy for their photo to be used in any context. And we talked about this more in the guide. So we're going to have another poll now. Please take a really good look at these images and think which of these would you choose to illustrate a review on school-based education programmes for the prevention of child sexual abuse, potentially difficult topic to illustrate. Would you choose the adult talking to the child, the children and teacher in the classroom, the crayons, the school bus, or the children in a classroom in Africa? Okay, that's interesting to see and this is a, of course a difficult subject to illustrate and there's some quite complex considerations here. So here are some things that we thought we should consider about this example. Um, the first thing is can the image help readers make a link with the topic? In a way all of these images help readers make a link with the topic but there are good ways of doing this without showing children. The school bus and the crayons are possible ways to indicate the topic of school. Images of a school building or empty classroom would be alternatives. The next thing is, is it necessary to show children's faces? It was interesting that quite a lot of you chose the one of the back views of the children and we think that that has a lot going for it, that choice. If you do choose an image with children, it's generally best to avoid showing their faces, especially where there are plenty of good alternatives to help people link the image with the subject matter. So the second one is a way of doing that. Another consideration is, does it reflect the studies included in the review? And this is something we always think about, not just with this kind of subject. So the image of crayons suggests a link with children, possibly with school, and they're the type of writing things used with 
by young children, an age group which is included in this review. So we might not pick that if it had just been older children. As for um, the last image, the studies in the Cochrane Review were conducted in North America, Europe and Asia. So this image doesn't reflect the population actually studied. But if you think about uh, thinking about whether the image is right for your setting, if you were wanting to share uh, this dissemination product in an African country, you might want to choose that because it reflects your setting. And then the last point about this is, does it show best practice? Image number one with the, the teacher talking to the girl, that some of you chose that, but when we looked at that carefully, we thought that is quite problematic because as well as showing the girl's face, in the context of this review, that girl and teacher could be seen to be discussing a disclosure of sexual abuse but the image doesn't show best practice because another child is present. This next item is about avoiding images that might stigmatise, reinforce stereotypes or could be dehumanising, such as images that crop out people's heads without a clear reason for doing that. The image on the right might be a more positive, respectful alternative for illustrating a review about overweight and obesity. Consider images also that challenge stereotypes and offer positive alternatives. For example, consider showing both men and women of different ethnicities as nurses or surgeons, if, if that reflects the reality of your location. Be aware also that minority ethnic groups are often depicted negatively in the media, which makes it even more important that we challenge such depictions and offer positive alternatives. This item is about avoiding images that might trigger unwanted feelings or behaviour. Triggers may produce uncomfortable feelings in people or prompt behaviours that they wish to avoid. These will be most obvious for, but not limited to, topics like smoking cessation, alcohol and drug use, self-harm and a range of other mental health problems. The example here, it's really common for dissemination products about smoking cessation to include images of tobacco related products, but this can be triggering for people who smoke as well as former smokers, so it's best avoided. With regards to mental health, we've included some strict guidance. Do not use images which could indicate a method or means of suicide or self-harm in any circumstance. And if in doubt, consider using an alternative such as an abstract image. So we're going to look with uh, one of the examples we've worked examples from our guide that hopefully ties together a lot of the issues that we've been talking about and lots of the items in the guide. So again, subject like traumatic brain injury is really difficult to illustrate, particularly when more than one image is needed, as we did for a blog on this topic, aimed at families making a decision about a relative with traumatic brain injury. So we're going to have another poll now. Which of these images might you choose to illustrate this topic? Would you choose the empty operating theatre? The doctor talking to the patient in the bed? The surgeon's operating on the top right, the surgeon's operating bottom left with using the microscope, or the doctor speaking with patients' relatives. Okay, quite a split, which I think just uh, isn't surprising given the difficulty of, of illustrating this. So the things that we thought through with this choice uh, is how could we show our target audience that this is relevant to them and without putting them off? That was really quite difficult. Showing an accident scene could be distressing, of course, as could showing a critically ill patient. Plus, it can be really difficult to find uh, an image of someone with the right wound dressing, for example, and the right surrounding equipment. So the woman sitting in the bed there just isn't realistic as a patient with traumatic brain injury. Then there's the question of the operation being difficult to illustrate. We found images that were graphic or or they were textbook diagrams. 
So the others are images you might consider, but we felt the empty operating theatre felt quite cold and impersonal when we were trying to reach families. The one on the top right doesn't look credible for this type of surgery, um, whereas the one of them using the operating microscope, it does look credible. We weren't convinced we had the expertise to know that ourselves, so we asked our neurosurgeon and he said, yep, that's the right equipment, but it doesn't show best practice as the surgeon's hair isn't fully covered. That might be what sometimes happens in real life, but it's not what's ideal to show. The last image shows a discussion of family speaking with a clinician, and in fact, that's what we used. We consulted with our neurosurgeon, and he confirmed with us that the decision would most likely be made by a patient's loved ones rather than the patient themselves. So that was another detail we needed to understand at what point and by whom would this decision need to be made. So decision making was a really important element to show in images that we chose and alternatives to images showing people are these kind of images here. So we're going to have our final poll now. Of these four images, which would you choose to illustrate this topic, again, of traumatic brain injury and whether surgeries were the risks? Would it be the hospital signage, the shoes with the arrows, the footpaths or the seesaw? So it's interesting to see there that the hospital signage seems to be the, the winning image for you and, and the shoes and arrows the, the least favourite and, and would probably agree with that actually. So the image of the red shoes indicates decision making, but we felt that for this topic it really strikes the wrong emotional tone. It's, not import, it's important to not seem frivol uh, frivolous with such a sensitive topic. We did actually use that image in a different blog. Uh, it was about a patient making choices about living with long-term conditions, but the image didn't feel suitable for this topic about a patient who would be in intensive care. The image of the footpaths feels a long way from the relevant setting of intensive care, and we felt that it wouldn't help our audience make an immediate link with the topic. The image of the seesaw suggests balancing benefits and harms, However, it suggests a weighted decision, in this case, a risk that outweighs the benefits. And we didn't want to suggest that this was the case. In the end, we chose the image showing the surgery sign. It both suggests a hospital setting, but also the arrows going in different directions, one to the wards and one to surgery, suggests a choice. However, it's important to be aware that for translation purposes, any images with words in it can present a problem anyone translating the blog might choose to substitute that image for one that doesn't contain text. So a last thing we just wanted to flag is that cartoons or graphics can be a useful alternative, particularly if you're struggling to find appropriate photos. But the same rules apply. You need to think about accuracy, diversity, sensitivity and so on. So the image on the right, you know, it's important at the moment that we show healthcare professionals wearing masks during the pandemic. So a couple of key take home points that we'd really like you to hang on to, you know, one is to check every single detail of an image because people with expertise will spot errors and it's got to be accurate and credible across the whole thing. And to check with someone with that relevant expertise if you have any doubts at all. And we hope you'll explore and use the guide to choosing images. We'd love to hear from you if you do and to know how that's helped or if there's anything you think we've missed. Thank you for listening. So just to say as well that you can find the full guide on the Cochrane training website. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, we can see there have been a number of questions in the chat, but if you have any more questions, 
do feel free to type them in, into the live Q&A um, now. Um, we do hope that you might be able to apply this learning to your own work, but also maybe to be better able to spot issues with images you see in the media. So we'll just start with, um, we'll begin with the first question and I'll ask, I'll ask you, Sarah, first and then I'll respond after you. So what's the most difficult thing that you've had to illustrate and why? The obvious thing that springs to mind was we did a whole series on uh, called The Problem with Sex about sexual health problems across lots of different uh, health conditions. And it was a whole series of about eight or nine blogs. Massive challenge. Lots of really interesting conversations in the office about whether we were striking the right tone. And as with all special series, we had to get a variety. We didn't just want to use pictures of discussions or just photos. But it worked really well, and we had a lot of really positive responses to what we did choose. You can go to Everton and Cochrane and look and see what we ended up with. But uh, I think what was key, really, obviously, bearing – we didn't have the guide then, we hadn't made it – but bearing in mind the need to be respectful and sensitive. Um, but we went for quite a few abstract images, and images with people we were just careful that we were respectful. And totally knew what we had to avoid because if you search for sexual problems in a stock library you will get terrible 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 images that fall into a few sort of main categories and so we that was easy what we didn't want to do and what we did want to do uh, was a harder thing to achieve but we were really pleased with what we ended up with and just to follow on from that i would say that we also had some challenges with choosing images to illustrate blogs in our recent series on endometriosis. Um, for example, we you know we're trying to illustrate a blog about surgery for, the, for a painful condition. And on the one hand, there's a risk of showing surgical settings or procedures that could be off-putting or distressing. And on, on the other hand, you have some very cliched stock images of, of, of people you know, holding, holding their stomach kind of grimacing with, with cramps. So we contacted, to get around some of these issues, we contacted a couple of artists who do, who do art to represent either their own experience of endometriosis or the experience of others. Um, we find with this series and with others that using artwork can be a relatable and authentic and respectful alternative to, to stock images. So if we move on to the next question, um, I see you mentioning stock images all the time, uh, both on this talk and in the PDF guide that we have produced. Does it mean that Cochrane pays for these photos? Are they available, paid for, for disseminating all Cochrane reviews? So anybody who works within Cochrane is able to have access to a shared uh, Dropbox folder. Um, Cochrane uh, organises and, and manages this centrally. Um, the best thing to do is to get in touch with Mariah, who works in the knowledge translation team, to ask for access to that folder. And the folder, you can search it by keyword, and there are also subfolders with um, focused on different uh, topics. So, so the best thing to do is to get in touch with Mariah about that. It's also really worth, I think, just flagging that there are sources of free photographs that are worth exploring. And we've got a section in the guide uh, about sources of photos. And we quite often go to unsplash.com. Uh, That's a good source. Welcome images have uh, free to use images. And of course, what Celine's just mentioned about contacting artists, often they're very happy to have their work shared and used. So there are mercifully alternatives to stock. Uh, the next question, if you spot an image online that you feel is really inappropriate, would you suggest letting that person know, particularly if it is a larger organisation, and do you have any tips for doing that? Uh, I would personally say I don't think that's a problem at all. I think on the occasion where we have had individuals get in touch with us to flag something in particular about an image. Um, we have actually just really appreciated that. Um, I think a lot of sorry, go. No, go ahead, Sarah. I think a lot of it's quite a grey area because we mentioned earlier on about um, smoking, pictures of cigarettes and smoking um, paraphernalia being triggering. We hadn't sort of appreciated this till quite recently. WHO, I think I'm right in saying, and other big organisations still use these kind of pictures 
for illustrating smoking cessation campaigns. And I think we've kind of tried to put our own house in order and try to inform ourselves about what's good practice. I'm not sure how much we can influence others in doing that. And again, about using images of children, it's really interesting. If you go and look in the guide at a little bit that we were sort of looking into, lots of, uh, I, I don't think Cochrane even has got a policy about this. We've just had to make our own sort of decisions about this. Um, so there's quite a lot of grey, difficult. So another question, uh, is there a balance to be found between reflecting real life and showing best practice? <laughs> I think we tend to err on the side of showing best practice where it comes to something like one of the one of the you know, things that we fell down over was we showed what we thought. Yeah, yeah, that's a real life image of a child on a school playing field using an asthma inhaler um, just directly. And uh, we were very quickly criticised for that because that wasn't best practice. They should have been using a spacer. Now, we know realistically and probably particularly on the school playing field, that's how they'd be using it. But we have some kind of responsibility as a health organisation to, you know, that the images can be used as things for people to learn from in themselves. And it, it was important to get that right. So we, we changed that. However, just again, thinking about one of the illustrations we've talked about, you know, um, that our colleagues in Cochrane, Norway, work trying to get that balance of, of you know, what's, what's real life and what's best practice in terms of PPE. And that's going to vary enormously with geographical setting. So there's also something there to think about where are we sharing this. So another question, can you please give us an example? Oh, sorry, can you give us a source of information about potential triggers for smoking, for suicide, etc? I'd like to read more about it and to prevent bad use of images. So, so we've gone into a lot more detail um, in the item on triggers in the full guide and we've included references there so please do take a look at that section. Um, we developed that section um, with, with input from colleagues at the Common Mental Disorders Group um, but you should find full references in the guide. Another question, have you been able to do any work to evaluate your use of images? Does this approach result in more clicks on blogs or reviews, fewer complaints, for example? So we have a, we know of work within Cochrane. Cochrane centrally did a small study a while back and they were looking at whether including images in tweets means that more people click through to the content that you're sharing alongside it compared to using no image. And they found that that is the case. More people do click through when we use an image. Um, as for comparing good and bad images, we haven't done any particular work to, 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 to look into that. Um, I think we don't want to share the bad ones, do we? <laughs> no, ex no, exactly. It's a challenging thing to look into, really. I don't know if you had anything else to say about that, Sarah. So another question, what is the biggest change in choosing images in post-COVID and pre-COVID times regarding public health guidelines? It's given us a massive headache. <laughs> Just really hard because we are, despite me talking about these other sources, us talking about these other sources, we, we still do rely on stock libraries for the majority of our images and it's... We just feel that in current times, we should show people wearing PPE in situations where they would. Um, and we should show people self social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. And it can be quite hard to find images that show that, that also tick all of our other boxes. Um, so um, we were thinking, if you look back at our blogs, you know, some years hence, or hopefully even sooner than that, it'll, it'll reflect a strange time um, because it'll so clearly show the sort of measures that we're taking now. I'm not sure if that's what that question meant, but, you know, I think that has been a, a big a big difference for us currently. So another question, is a, a bad image better than no image? Uh, this is an interesting one because, as we know, and as I just mentioned, we know that including an image does tend to increase click-through to the content that you're sharing uh, uh, along with the, the image, which is, you know, a really important part of our work. We're trying to drive people to look at to look at our content. 
Um, but of course, there are, as we've talked throughout this presentation, big risks to choosing poor images. We can put people off. We can risk looking out of touch. And as a health organisation, it's really important that we are accurately, appropriately, realistically depicting health and healthcare topics. Um, we can really undermine people's trust in us as an organisation if we don't do that well. So I suppose the key thing really is, is to, if possible, try and choose an image, but really do check its details. And if in doubt, try and check with somebody who has relevant expertise or experience in that area. I think it's quite interesting to think about your own response to what you consider to be a bad image. And one of my really, really early lessons in this whole business of images was seeing an NHS choices page, I think it was, that was encouraging people in the UK to get out there and exercise. And they showed a, a, their companies with a, photograph of a woman um, exercising on a beautiful beach of the sort of Caribbean type and the comments that it got people saying that really wants to make me just go to the fridge and get a bottle of wine out and um, something to eat and sit on my sofa and not go out and exercise because it doesn't look like that in Birmingham or indeed anywhere else here um, so I think I think we can all probably just reflect on our own reactions to what we think are not good choices and how off-putting they can be So another question, how do you find out if an image is culturally appropriate for the population that you are communicating about? I think they find someone. <laughs> yeah, the key thing here is to check to check with somebody. And um, we worked with colleagues at Cochrane Common Mental Disorders again, um, and thinking about a couple of the examples that we included in the guide, and, and, and they were um, trying to choose images in some engagement work that they were trying to do to get um, Maori people involved with their work. And, and they, they found that the key thing is that they needed to get that cultural expertise and input because they it, without that, they just weren't sure of what they might not quite get right. So it's about checking, really. I think also it's just, it, it's really hit home to us that we don't always know what we don't know. And that example Selena just talked about you know they'd have known they didn't have that knowledge but we've come across other things we thought gosh just wouldn't we wouldn't have known that that wasn't the right thing and so I think increasingly we just want to check with somebody that does have more expertise than us. So another question does using a cartoon or a vector avoid lots of the potential problems with photos? I think quality, image quality, is a potential problem. Um, but it's lovely to use our own when we can. Um, you know, a drawing somebody's down or a photograph of an event or as long as we've got correct permissions, of course, uh, and credit those things appropriately. But, I mean, Selena, you're more the tech one than me. I mean, the thing there about image, uh, about the quality of the image? Sorry, yeah, so about, do you ever get your own image or photo suggest one? Uh, I mean, you're, you're free to take photos of things, I think, as long as you have the permission of the people that you are wanting to photograph for the particular use that you, you want to have it for. Um, the key things is to try and make sure that it's of sufficient resolution. And we've got quite a bit of detailed information in the guide about how you go about checking that. Um, you need to make sure as well that the image that you have is the right dimensions for um, where you're going to share it, whether that's on social media or on your website. Um, but in, in general, there's no there's no problem with, um, with with getting your own images. But I think that we find that the, our first port of call is to either look at the um, photos that are available to us through Cochrane, to look in a stock library, or to look at some of these free alternative sources, um, many of which are healthcare specific, and that we have listed in Appendix One of the guide. So final question uh, about using cartoons or vectors, does that avoid lots of potential problems with photos? Yeah, I think the key thing there, I mean, you saw the slide I put up about uh, cartoons or vectors, and in fact, that was something we also did during our recent endometriosis series, that that can be really helpful. And especially at the moment, again, with um, having to think about PPE and who's in the room and all of that, you know, it can be difficult to find a suitable picture of a, somebody having a CT scan, whatever. Um, so that could be really good. And also they can be quite bold and impactful and they look good, you know, for your product. 
So that can be a good thing. But same rules apply. We were looking for one of an operating theatre and it was it was ridiculous. There's, I had some sort of shelving at the back with all kinds of random scientific items in to say this is a science photo, but you know, stupid if you know what's actually in an operating theatre, um, which our audience would. So you do have to think critically about those images too. So thank you very much. I think that we have got through all of the questions that were there. So we finished a little bit ahead of time. Um, we just have a few housekeeping announcements. If you want to watch this session or any of the others um, throughout the three days that you might miss, all of the sessions are recorded so that you can watch them at a later date. Um, so there's now a coffee break until half past 12 when there's an opportunity to join colleagues for a social lunch break. Um, there'll be nine topic rooms that you can choose from um, where you can meet with colleagues with similar interests and backgrounds. So that's at half past 12 in the platform. You can also visit the project hub throughout the day and browse through some of the projects that we have in the area. And there are some opportunities to meet with some of the project representatives and our funders this afternoon. The full timetable of that can be found in the platform. So thank you very much for, um, for joining us today. Thank you.